with the prelude in D major, we are back after the emotion of the C sharp minor. We are back in a much lighter mood and more to the point, we are back in a truly didactic uh, kind of prelude. It is based on a similar pattern than the other, which is that there is a formula which is established at the beginning. And then the prelude just goes through all manners of key, uh, but following the same basic pattern. Now, it gets a little more sophisticated each time. And this one has an interesting uh, way of three notes up, then one note down, three notes going down, and then one note going up. So it's sort of reverse. So the whole prelude is made of this kind of melisma thing. Ta di di po, di da da di. Tempo again. We because it's actually a little bit fiddly to play. Uh, we have really come to treat it as an etude. And again, the tradition says something like, uh, which to me doesn't cut it. I take it on the upper range of the tempo ordinario range, if you want. Uh, And it's an amusing one because the, the formula is simple, but actually on the instrumental pianistic level, um, it is full of little trap. And if you don't concentrate, you might uh, trip up, actually. The fugue is a rather grand affair. It is the first of this kind in the well-tempered, which derives from what you call ouverture à la française. Now, this is a grand, rather pompous style with a lot of what you call dotted rhythm. The, the rendition of this type of writing in the piano is tricky. On the harpsichord, you, you, it sounds immediately brilliant and very grand. The nature of the sound of the piano is ill-suited to this kind of music. And every time Bach writes one, we are a little bit in trouble. You have to play it fairly loud, otherwise you miss the point. But at the same time, it needs a certain lightness in delivery with a lot of ornaments, which is very difficult to do loud. Quiet ornaments are much easier. And yet here you can't be quiet. There is also a musicological debate about what you call the dotting. So, uh, <laughs> How much doing this long, short, long, short, long? If you follow strictly what Bach is writing, you will do. Sorry. That would be the exact rhythm, and that what used to be played. We do do now know that Bach and indeed the whole Baroque period, was actually fairly approximative in its writing of this type of thing. And that it is desirable to really shorten the, the short notes. It's a bit difficult to do convincingly. And you've got to find the right balance so that it doesn't sound military. And yet that it doesn't sound weak. to find some sort of in-between which is satisfying and it's very much an instinctive thing you absolutely couldn't put it on paper mm. 
So there is some unevenness and the, all the short notes are not going to be all the same. Even this figure needs some movement, it can't be. So there is actually a great deal of fluidity, which is something that not all the interpreters of Baroque music seem to realize, at least not when they play on the piano. The harpsichord demands more rhythmic fluidity because that's all that there is. There is no possibility of dynamic contrast. So the how you are going to manage rhythm is going to effectively make or break an interpretation. On the piano, there has been a tradition of playing Bach a little bit like we would play, if you want, Hindemith or neoclassical Stravinsky in a sort of motoric way. And the Baroque age has nothing motoric about it. It's all in curves and uh, lines and it needs a great deal more flexibility within a strict frame and pulse. And that is what is difficult to achieve in this fugue. For example, uh, you can't do a you can't do that. So it is one of those which is particularly tricky on the piano.